Good morning. Good morning up there. Are they going to wave? All right. Thank you. I'm going to be brief. Um, in continuing our theme of kindness to ourselves and kindness to others, um, first let me reintroduce myself. Janice Robinson. I wear three hats. I'm Vice President for Diversity and Community Affairs. I'm Assistant Professor in the Higher and Post-Secondary Education Program. And uh, the hat I'm wearing this morning is I am your Teachers College uh, Title IX Coordinator. So my job is to introduce um, our speakers. But before I do that, I just need to know how many of you have had an opportunity to view the PETSA sexual violence uh, prevention video. That is the personal empowerment through sex through self-awareness? Yes, 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 raise your hands, raise your hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because we have to record that. So those of you who have not done it, how many have raised, raise your hands, please? Come on, don't be shy. OK, I'm just simply asking you that please get that done um, so we can um, get that in the record. Uh, the TC is very, as you know, committed to your um, academic success. And we're committed to your safety. And so you may know now, with all the headlines nationally, um, that there is federal laws and federal guidance and the new New York State uh, sexual assault enough is enough law. And it does require that we educate our, our new students. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. And so I'm going to turn it over to um, folk from our gender-based misconduct uh, office. Uh, they will be talking about the gender-based misconduct policy for students. It will be Serena Barnett, Title IX investigator at Columbia, and Adrian Blount, uh, the associate director of case management. And after that, we will have uh, someone from uh, Columbia's Sexual Violence Response and Rape Crisis Anti-Violence Center, Support Center, that's Kristen Defer. See you soon. Everybody. Um, so we're here to talk a little bit about the gender-based misconduct policy um, here at Teachers College of Columbia as a whole. Um, we are going to be talking about some topics of a sensitive nature, so if at any point you feel like you need to step out of the room, um, please feel free. So as, um, as she mentioned, we are from the gender-based misconduct office. Uh, there's three offices here on campus that handle gender-based misconduct, as you can see on the screen. Um, Columbia's Sexual Violence Response Office, which you'll hear from after, is what we call the confidential office. And then there's two investigative offices, our office, the Gender-Based Misconduct Office, which falls under the middle box of student conduct community standards, as well as the equal opportunity and affirmative action. And so you can kind of see on red on the screen, SVR says confidential, and the other two offices say non-confidential. We talk about confidential and non-confidential, it doesn't mean that the information that would be received by those offices is disseminated on campus. It just means that if a student goes to that office or a faculty member makes a report to that office, if it's a non-confidential office, they are required to file a report that comes to our office. If someone goes to a confidential office, they are not um, a reportable office, so they do not have to report anything that a student tells them. Um, as well, sexual violence response is a supportive and advocate office. Um, they support complainants in any kind of process or any kind of um, misconduct, whereas uh, Student Conduct and Community Standards, our office, the Gender-Based Conduct Office, and Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action, we are investigative offices that result in a disciplinary process. So when we receive reports, we're investigating, we're looking into it, um, determining if formal action needs to be taken, and if it comes to it or if a student wants to go through a full process or the conduct requires it, it results in a disciplinary process, which is a range of uh, different disciplinary options. Um, as well, our office is kind of unique in that we do offer supportive services as well to all students that are subject to, uh, to gender-based misconduct, as well as anyone that's accused of gender-based misconduct. So in our office, we call someone that's um, subjected to it a complainant and someone that's being accused of it a respondent which um, Adrian will talk a little bit more about those supportive services later on. So the purpose of our presentation today is to talk about the policy, the process, and the people. So I'm sure in, in your various walks of life, you've all come across a different terminology about gender-based misconduct. And when we talk about gender-based misconduct, we're really talking about an umbrella term. And the purpose of us going into it and talking about it here is so that everyone understands how these policies are defined here at Columbia. 
um, because it's important to note that our policies are going to be broader than what you'll see in some of the criminal law and civil law. Um, and so we want to make sure that everyone understands the policies as they apply here. And we talk about gender-based misconduct it can be applied by anyone, stranger, uh, acquaintances, classmates, intimate partners, regardless of gender identity or if, uh, regardless of protected class. And we talk about this policy. Um, this policy applies specifically the gender-based misconduct policy for students. It's going to apply to any student while they're here at Columbia, no matter where they are. And that's whether it's an on-campus activity, an off-campus activity, or in connection with the university program. Um, you may hear later on from your Equal Opportunity Office, uh, these definitions that we're going to go into, they apply to faculty and staff or anyone that's a third party vendor of Columbia as well. So here are the first definitions of gender-based misconduct. I'm not going to go through the slides, I'm just going to kind of pull out some key points of it. We talk about sexual harassment and gender-based harassment, the underlying um, issue is that someone is being harassed. When we talk about sexual harassment though, we're talking about something of a sexual nature. So typically, that could be you know, a classmate kind of coming up to another classmate, rubbing their shoulders, moaning in their ear, um, things that are more sexual in nature. When we talk about gender-based um, harassment, we're talking about someone being harassed based on their gender or uh, their gender expression. So that could be sitting in a class and someone's asking the female student to take notes because females are secretaries, that's what they do. Or saying, you know, why are you in this class? Uh, you know, men aren't teachers, things like that. That would be gender-based harassment and that would be um, prohibited by our policy. We talk about dating violence and domestic violence. We're talking about the same type of violence, the same underlying abuse that's going on in the relationship. But we found that it's important to separate them into dating violence and domestic violence so people that understand that no matter what type of relationship they are, whether it's a casual dating experience, whether it's a long-term dating experience, they know that they are protected by this policy and it applies to them. We talk about domestic violence, we're talking about um, those domestic partnerships that are protected under New York State law. So that's going to be um, intimate partners, people that have children, people that live together, uh, regardless of their gender. And so again, I'm just going to pull out uh, important parts. We talk about stalking. Um, a lot of time people think about stalking and they think about the guy that's hiding in the bushes, pops out with the glasses and says, I'm here, you know, or will you go out with me? But oftentimes we're seeing stalking to be a lot more subtle. Um, it could be the frequency of text messages, say sending 50 text messages over and over again and the person has told you that they don't want any contact. It could be checking in on social media at Starbucks and the person pops up at Starbucks. And then you check in at, I don't know, Walmart and they, check, and they pop up on Walmart. Um, so that's what we're often seeing when we talk about stalking. We talk about sexual exploitation. A lot of times we're seeing people send you know, those nude photos when they're in their relationship and everything's good. And the relationship is over, they're now being threatened with those photos. Um, the person is sending them an email saying, if you don't do X for me, I'm going to disseminate this photo to our class. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we talk about sexual exploitation. When we talk about sexual assault, it's divided, divided here at Columbia in non-consensual sexual intercourse and non-consensual sexual contact. So when I mentioned before that it's broader than the criminal law, this is really where you're going to see that it's broader than the criminal law. When we talk about non-consensual sexual intercourse, we're talking about penetration of any part of the body. So we're talking about, it could be penis to mouth contact, it could be um, vagina to mouth contact, any type of penetration of any of those openings would be considered a non-consensual sexual intercourse. And we talk about non-consensual sexual contact, we're talking about intentional sexual touching, um, of specific, specifically the certain body parts of the body that would most likely be sexual in nature. So that would be the buttocks, the groin, um, the breast, things like that. So here at Columbia, we had um, an affirmative consent policy. And I don't know if you guys have been paying attention much to the news and the recent legislation that's been going on in New York State, but what we've done is just adopted the, the affirmative consent that's been in that legislation. And so I just want to pull out that when we talk about affirmative consent, we're looking at knowing, voluntary, and a mutual decision. Um, and another part of this policy is that silence, when someone's laying there or not actively participating, that does not imply consent. When we look at consent and understanding consent, we want to say that and consenting to one form of uh, sexual activity does not mean you're consenting to another. So if you consent to oral sex, it does not mean someone's consenting to anal sex. And when we look at consent, we're looking at, whether, we're looking at it regardless of whether the person that's initiating, the person that would be making the first move, is under the influence of alcohol or not. We want to make sure that at each step of the sexual activity that both parties, no matter if they were the initiator or the initial receiver, 
is knowingly and mutually and voluntarily making that decision. And when we look at the sexual activity, we want to tell people, and I really want to point this out, that consent can be withdrawn at any time. And that's at any time of the sexual activity, at any stage of the sexual activity. And then we look at how consent can be negated. Two main reasons that consent can be negated is through coercion. When we talk about coercion, oftentimes people are thinking about force or threats. But here at Columbia, coercion can be a lot more subtle than that. It could be pestering someone endlessly until they give in to sex because you know, they want to just stop so they can get to the next thing. They want to stop you from continually annoying them until they give in to sex. When we talk about sex, uh, consent also, consent can be negated by someone who's incapacitated. And that's really where a lot of the focus when you think about the media has been um, concentrated on. And so when we look at incapacitation, we're looking at whether or not someone's incapacitated, not whether someone's intoxicated. So we're not saying that people cannot engage in sexual activity when they've had a drink or two, but we wanna make sure that when the person is deciding to engage in the activity, that they are um, able to make a rational and reasonable decision. <coughs> I'm going to switch gears a little bit, move away from talking about definitions and more about resources and reporting. Some of what I have to say will revisit what Serena mentioned earlier. So about confidential, confidential sources here at the university. Regardless of the office, whether it's a confidential or non-confidential office, you, Columbia staff will try to, will work to ensure your privacy and confidentiality to the greatest extent possible. So even offices that can't guarantee your confidentiality, which I will talk about in my next slide, will not disclose broadly what you talked about. We will only um, report information to other offices on a need to know basis, and that's to best support you as a student. Those the top five offices under confidential university offices, uh, confidential offices, um, operate under HIPAA guidelines. So if you would like to report an incident and you don't want that information to go outside of the person you're talking to, you need to talk to someone at CPS, the medical services, the ombuds office, uh, clergy, or SBR, and I'm, you'll hear from them shortly. Your, your TC ID, um, avails you to all of the Columbia resources. Anyone under the additional non-confidential university offices will report what you say because they are mandatory reporters and they have a duty to report. And the rationale of this um, mandate is to best support students who have experienced any behavior of misconduct. And uh, just, just a quick note, I understand some of you are community uh, assistants and uh, graduate interns. You, you also are um, beholden to the duty to report. So if someone disclosed information, please report it to uh, your university so that, we can, so that we can help. Once you submit a report, I'm a case manager, so it's not, the report doesn't end up in Cyberland. So I, my team will review the incident report and reach out to you. and. Um, inform you of all the resources that are available at the university and also set up a meeting to um, discuss more to figure out how we can best support. The meeting is is optional, it's not mandatory. You know, we our students, they have free will, options, and rights. So if you do not wish to engage my office, you don't have to. But if you do come to meet with me or someone on my team, we will inform you of your rights underneath the policy, and that also includes your right to participate or not. And if what you report rises to the level of an investigation, we'll inform you of your right to decline participation in that. Sometimes, based on the nature of the incident reported, um, the Title IX investigators will have to move forward and, and investigate uh, because they have a larger obligation to ensure the community um, at large. Um, not every incident that rises, that comes to uh, our office, rises to the level of an investigation. Sometimes people just want interim measures in place. And the, the rationale of that is to ensure the safety of all parties involved. Sometimes uh, people come to me and they don't, it, it, it's not a sexual assault, it's just uh, they're being harassed by someone in their class and an inter interim measure could be uh, switching the, the, their cohort, their section, or 
removing some one party from the class. Um, in the in the in the in the instance that uh, an incident rises to the level of an investigation, we have two investigators. They produce an investigative report, and uh, they also draft a recommendation. Their recommendation is forwarded to a panel to determine a level of responsibility or not, and then they send that to a sanctioning office. The alcohol and drug use amnesty policy um, is, is part of the new legislation. I just would like to point out the Colum that Columbia has always worked within the parameters. And basically the takeaway of this, um, this policy is, is for the student to know that if alcohol or drug use is involved in any um, incident of misconduct, the student will not be uh, found in violation of the overarching university policy against drug use and alcohol. Our students, again, back to options, free will, and choices. They have the right to report the incident to NYPD, Columbia University Public Safety, Teachers College Public Safety, or not. We don't force students to report an incident because we don't want to create a chilling effect, and we would like students who've been violated in some way to gain control and uh, have the power to control the process as best as they see fit. But in the event that a student wishes to report the incident to NYPD, Teachers College Public Safety, or Columbia Public Safety, we will support them through that process to engage certain offices um, within the uh, local community. Columbia has an anti-retaliation and anti-intimidation uh, policy in place. And this is like one of my favorite pieces of the policy because what this means is if someone is engaged in the process through our office or reports an incident of gender-based misconduct, the university protects that person against any form of retaliation and intimidation by other students or, or group members. And uh, um, the, the university policy is strictly enforced and the, um, the, the discipline will be handled separate and apart from the underlying gender-based misconduct case. So hopefully I do not have to interact with you in my office, but in the unfortunate instance where you need to report an incident, feel free to call my office at 212-854-1717, uh, or you can go online and follow report to sexualrespect.columbia.edu, and it's a two-click wonder, I like to say, you just hit file a report and then report your incident. That was a lot of information. Are there any questions? I just want to add one thing. She touched upon if you're serving in the capacity as a graduate intern or community assistant, um, you are technically considered an, an employee of Teachers College, an employee of Columbia, so you do have a duty to report um, an incident if someone comes up to you. You would be considered a non-confidential resource. And that's really in, your capa in, in that capacity of your, of your position. Um, and so if you do come across that, if you do find that, you can go to the same website, you can file the same report. You can also reach out to your supervisors. They'll be you know, well-versed in the policy <coughs> and how you can go about reporting. All right, thank you, good luck. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and set up my presentation, unless it's a... Yes, okay, great. So my name is Kirsten Defer, and I'm the Assistant Director of Training and Prevention at Sexual Violence Response. Um, we're also known as the Rape Crisis Center, um, and one of the things that we really do is provide advocacy, prevention, and outreach. Um, and in today's presentation, I'll be talking a little bit about our services, Hopefully, if you walk away with one thing, you'll know what can someone do if they've been affected by violence, either directly or indirectly. We'll also provide a snapshot of you know, ways that trauma can affect somebody, and then provide some do's and don'ts on what you could do if somebody does come to you and tell you about something that's happened to them, either recently or in the past. So with all that, I want to acknowledge that this isn't necessarily an easy thing to talk about. It's challenging, and so I encourage you to practice self-care throughout this presentation. Um, so do what you need to do to take care of yourself, um, because we want to just acknowledge that this can be really hard to talk about. So, and I also want to note that this might directly relate to what you're doing here at Columbia and Teachers College. So keep in mind that as we go forward, and we're not going to be able to co cover everything in this broad issue, um, but hopefully we'll provide a few 
tools and snapshots about what this issue entails um, to, as you get started here at Columbia. So what does SVR do? We do three things. We do advocacy, and that means providing direct services to students who are affected by sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, gender-based violence, street harassment, and really a broad range of issues. Um, so many things that can be encompassed in this issue of sexual violence. Um, and we provide those services to both students who have experienced something um, themselves or somebody that they know. Maybe it's a fellow Columbia student, maybe it's a friend back home, maybe it's a family member, but we can help out in any of those capacities. Another thing we do is really prevention. We want to provide educational opportunities for us to learn and grow and think about this issue very deeply. It's something that we can't just learn about once in a 30 minute presentation. We really hope that people will continue their education throughout both their time at Columbia University and then in their own personal and professional lives. And then last we do, we do outreach, which I'm not sure if, it can see, if you can see it on the slide. Great, there's outreach. So we wanna make sure that every single Columbia University student, faculty, staff member knows who to call, where to go to in case something happens. And just like our former presenters said, we hope that nothing happens that would require our services, our, our direct services, but if something does happen, please know that we're here to help. <coughs> so that's our services and what we do in a nutshell. Um, and that's all under the guise of confidentiality. So our office, Sexual Violence Response, is one of only five resources on campus that is confidential. And what that means is if somebody tells me or another staff member or a volunteer with our office about something that's happened, I'm not obligated to go and tell the university about it. It's a great way to come and talk about options, decide if somebody wants to file a report with student conduct or EOAA, if they want to go to the police, or if they just kind of want to talk about what something's happened. You know, maybe they just need to digest a little bit to process the event that's taken place. So there are a handful of exceptions for our confidentiality. And that's gonna be true of any kind of confidential resource, regardless of whether it's on a Columbia or a university campus or at a state campus, whether it's private or public, any kind of rape crisis center or confidential resource will have to break confidential a handful of times. So those exceptions for us is if a student is under the age of 18, then we will have to break confidentiality. If there's suspicion of abuse, so if that's child abuse, elder abuse, or abuse of a person with a significant disability, if the disclosure may prevent harm to themselves or to someone else. So if someone does call our helpline and indicate that they're suicidal, we are going to reach out for help because we want to ensure the safety of that individual or if they indicate that they are planning to harm someone else, then we will have to reach out and um, gain uh, access other excuse me, services on campus. So just to note those few exceptions. And then lastly, in very rare cases, a judge could order us to release information for civil or criminal proceedings. So just to note, that's really rare, but wanna acknowledge that it is a possibility. And again, any of these exceptions could apply to rape crisis centers in any context. Um, so confidentiality is really important though because as you're talking to other faculty members or administrative staff or advisors, it might be that you've developed a really strong relationship with someone, but please note that they have limitations in their confidentiality. So some of the reasons that students have been reaching out to SVR, um, we see a lot of students reaching out for support um, because of an incident related to sexual violence. And those incidents might have happened on campus um, so maybe here at Teachers College or on, on you know, Broadway, or maybe it's something that's happened off campus. You know, maybe downtown in the Lower East Side or you know, even in a, another country or another state, somebody's visiting back home and something takes place, we can support um, for any kind of incident. Maybe we don't have advocates right there in that, um, in that country that you're visiting, but we can help connect to those resources that are local. We also provide services for incidents that have happened recently since becoming a Columbia University student or something that's happened in the past. We've actually seen quite a few students reach out to our office because their experiences or their dialogue with peers or what they're learning in their class is triggering something that's maybe happened in high school or maybe in their undergraduate institution or maybe um, even as a child. And so something that's happened in the past, we can certainly provide support around those issues. 
And then lastly, I think I've covered this, but just in case you do know somebody, that friend, that family member, that loved one, um, that you'd like support, and how do, how do I help this person? We've seen students come in and say, I'm dating somebody new, and they shared with me that they're a survivor. How can I best support this person that I'm dating? How can I be an ally? How can we have a healthy relationship together? So those are some of the things that we can talk about. We also provide information. There's a lot of processes that are involved if someone's experienced trauma, if someone's filing a report. It can be confusing, and so we want to explore those rights, those options, talk about what accommodations might be available. If somebody is struggling to finish coursework or maybe attend class, we can help navigate that system to hopefully get some accommodations for, with, and work with that department or that professor. So those are all options that we can discuss. And then accompaniment to the hospital, to a court proceeding, to the police, to public safety, to file a report with the university. Sometimes these, these procedures can be challenging. Um, maybe asking questions that a survivor isn't necessarily prepared for. So having somebody with them, to go with them and just be by their side, to be able to anticipate what's happening, um, that can make a difference in the survivors, um, how they get help and what they do next afterwards. And then lastly, we do have students that reach out for educational programming. We provide workshops year round. We do trainings and presentations. We provide co-sponsorship for events. So maybe you're part of a student group or you know, a group of you all is going to host an event about sexual violence or intimate partner violence. We can possibly provide a financial support to some degree. We can also provide materials for outreach. I will make sure that there are brochures about our office available in your administrative offices in case you'd like to pick one up. And then also about getting involved. We do have volunteer programs for peer advocates who provide direct services to students, as well as peer educators. And I know that some of your peers at Teachers College are getting involved with our office this year, so that's great to have some peers in your, in your midst that can be able to be experts on this issue. So, that's a lot of information about our office, a lot about our services, um, and I want to highlight that this topic can connect to everybody. So think to yourself, how does this topic connect to you? Just take a moment. And think about how does it connect to you on a personal level, on a professional level, on a societal level? And on that personal level, it might be that either you yourself have experienced something along that spectrum of behaviors that we call sexual violence. It might be that you know somebody close to you or in your family that's gone through these incidents. Um, being graduate students, you all are probably more likely to have encountered this issue in your life already. And so we wanna just acknowledge that and name that. It can affect someone's ability to participate actively in school. It could be that you're attending a class that isn't even related to sexual violence, but the topic might come up. It's something that touches so many issues. You know, when we're talking about gender, we're talking about society, we're talking about how people are together in relationship, how people are learning, thinking about that. And that can really impact someone's ability to be present, to be participating. On the professional level, I know you all are here at Teachers College, and I know there's a lot of disciplines that fall within this realm. <coughs> However, students that you're teaching or talking to, whether they're secondary school or elementary school or even at a college or university level, if they're struggling in school, it could be because of sexual violence or family domestic violence. And so that could connect directly to your profession and what you're studying. And then lastly, on a societal level, sexual violence is unfortunately very pervasive. And we live in a culture in which violence is normalized. In media and in politics, and not to mention, just to be honest, that sexual assault is an incredibly hot topic these days. You'd really be hard pressed not to see something in the news about campus sexual assault, or consent, or even rape culture. And so I want to highlight here that Columbia University is actually doing quite a bit. Um, I'm actually here in, in my role as one of uh, six new members that have joined the staff as sexual violence response within the last year. And you just heard from student conduct, they've also added case managers. So we're excited to be part of something that's changing. And hopefully you all can be part of that too. So 
there are this broad spectrum of behaviors that fall within our office's realm. And any number of these things could be reasons why students reach out to help. So we often might think of sexual violence as involving physical acts. But as you can see from the spectrum that ranges from non-physical all the way to forced penetration, there are quite a bit of action, actions that are not physical in nature. There might be harassing phone calls or text messages about keeping tabs on a partner, or maybe exploitation or threatens, threats to post a picture to, um, to social media or share among friends. And those might not be physical, but they can have a really big impact on someone. And no matter what the violent acts, we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to validate someone's experiences. Um, I'll talk a in a minute about what we can do if we know somebody that's been affected. But that's something where if we can validate and really s let people know that this incident matters and this can affect you, that'll help change their art culture and how we're thinking about this issue. And one of the things about these behaviors that they all have in common is a lack of consent. Consent is absolutely critical in any kind of situation, especially ones that are involving sexuality and sexual activity. And just to note that these things can happen to anyone, and they can be perpetrated by anyone. So that's regardless of gender, race, age, ability, or sexual orientation. And these things can happen in a variety of contexts. Um, while there is this idea out there that the perpetrators of violence are strangers to victims. In fact, most sexual violence takes place among people that know each other, either know each other as acquaintances or know each other as intimate partners. So one of the things that we see common among students reaching out to SVR, one of the trends we see is seeking students seeking help with an intimate or a romantic partner. So in thinking about these uh, spectrum, the spectrum of behaviors, um, I want to highlight that there are lots of effects that violence can have on someone. And those effects could take place, especially if somebody has had more than one incident occur, or if they've had um, different kinds of incidents, but you know, over their life, lifetime. So some of the effects that violence might have on someone is are physical. So a few examples are maybe resulting in feeling on edge or being easily startled. Somebody might have a panic attack, might have trouble sleeping, possibly nightmares or insomnia, might have trouble with eating, for example, not eating at all, or maybe overeating or having stomach aches. So in terms of cognitive effects of gender-based violence, somebody might have re-experiencing like flashbacks or intrusive memories or feeling very overwhelmed. Somebody might feel disbelief or shock. Some of you might actually minimize what's happened to them and say that it's actually not a big deal. They might avoid reminders of that incident or that situation. <coughs> some of you might have impaired thinking, so trouble making decisions or feel confused or have difficulty concentrating. Someone might have an effect on their self-image, thinking that they're damaged goods, maybe changes in body image, or decreased sense of one's abilities, which might impact their ability to be present at school. They might have emotional effects on gender, of gender-based violence, might be something like external, feeling very angry towards others, might have fantasies of revenge or homicidal ideation. Somebody might also feel shame or embarrassment. They might blame themselves or think about suicide. Somebody might feel overwhelmed by emotional response or maybe have difficulty regulating their emotions. Um, or someone might feel very numb and not experience any emotions at all or disassociate. There's no one way that someone is experiencing violence. There's no one formula for how a survivor <coughs> responds. And as we hear these stories, we really want to keep that in mind, that someone who's impacted by trauma and somebody else who's had the same exact experience, they might have very different reactions. And then lastly, behaviorally. So somebody might withdraw from their friends or family. They might isolate themselves or have difficulty going out or leaving their home. They might rely on others and develop codependent relationships. They might not want to be alone or have loose boundaries. They might increase their use of alcohol or other drugs use. 
they might avoid certain substances. For example, if an incident involved alcohol, they might not want to be around alcohol. And then lastly, professional and academic influence. They might have difficulty attending work or school, or maybe they have an intensified focus on work or school. So somebody might dive in in order to avoid thinking about the incident or um, dealing with their emotions. And again, survivors may experience one or two of these effects, and they might experience some of these effects immediately or in the future. And just to keep in mind that there is no one way that a survivor will experience violence. So thinking about all of these effects and how somebody could be impacted by violence or trauma, especially if they've had repeat incidents, we want to think about how do we give support to somebody that's disclosed that they've experienced violence, either recently or in the past. So a handful of, of do's and don'ts here. We do want to listen to someone. We want to listen attentively. We might have to you know, put down our phones. We might have to you know, make sure and give somebody their full attention. We are a very busy society. In New York City, we're just on the go, go, go. We might have to stop and pause and say, here, I'm here to listen to you. That act of listening can be incredibly powerful. We don't want to, um, here actually, it's supposed to come up together. So we don't want to interrupt. Again, we're a very interrupting society. It's often our gut reaction to jump in there with something to say or with a question. We want to avoid interrupting somebody. We always want to believe what they say. Lots of survivors say, well, I tried to tell somebody, but they just didn't believe me. They didn't take me seriously. We want to avoid questioning circumstances. Because questioning those circumstances, saying, well, what are you doing with that abusive partner? I can't believe you're still with them. That won't make a survivor feel very good. It won't make them feel empowered to make change. It might actually put them on the defensive. And one of the things that a survivor needs the most at this time is that support that really encouragement, you know, messages that you're strong. So along those lines, offering that support and comfort, we want to avoid expressing judgment. So again, we're very judgmental people. You know, it's a human emotion. You know, we are going to have judgments, but what we do with them is really critical. Are we going to express that judgment? So sometimes responding to a survivor is about holding some things in, and we might have to deal with them ourselves, and that's one of the reasons why we really emphasize our co-survivor support, because it can be hard to hear and really process and take in somebody else's incident, somebody else's trauma. We wanna always ask open-ended questions, and I'll add one caveat there. We wanna ask open-ended questions if you have the time and the energy and the presence to engage in a conversation with them. Because open-ended questions are really gonna allow somebody to give as much information and um, feedback as possible. Questions like, you know, how are you feeling today? And be earnest about it. You know, be that sincere. Tell me how you are. Tell me more about what's happened. You know, what can I do for you? One of my favorite questions to ask, what can I do for you? We want to avoid asking why questions. Why were you out last night? Why are you with this person? Because again, that'll put someone on the defensive. We want to acknowledge that it takes a lot of strength to share, to come forward. That person, whoever they are, they've chosen to tell that your, their story with you because they trust you. They're really validating that you're an important person to them and you have some capacity to help them and support them. We want to avoid ignoring or minimizing what they share. In some people's minds, it might not seem like a big incident. However, we want to always acknowledge that that could have a big impact on someone. I see this a lot with people who are sharing stories about maybe street harassment heard quite a few people, either my peers or colleagues, say, oh, well, this is New York City. Everybody is harassed on the street. Just get over it. And that kind of message is actually really disempowering because street harassment can impact someone's day, you know, how they walk into work, how they walk into the classroom. Somebody might feel very rattled. They might feel very unsafe. They might be strategizing about how are they going to take a different route home instead of paying attention in class. So we always want to acknowledge that whatever somebody is sharing is a big deal. We want to clarify your role. So I do this on a very regular basis. I'm in education. I'm in training. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a case manager. I'm actually not even an advocate. And so my role is to help a survivor get to the person who is the advocate, who can provide those services. 
So we have to let people know what we can and cannot do for them. You know, that can be hard saying, actually, I might not be the best person to go with you to the hospital because I'm not sure what's going to happen there, but I know somebody who can help. We want to avoid being the, the hero or the rescuer. Again, this is a very human nature thing to do. I know how to save you. I know what you can do next. We want to really think about how do we phrase that as options? How can we help the survivor take their power and control back in their lives? How can we help them make the decisions that are best for them? Because every single scenario, every single situation is different. And somebody might have had a similar experience, but it's still a different person. So we don't want to just go in and say, I'm going to fix it for you, because they actually need to fix it. You know, they need to do that work and make those decisions. We do want to provide resources, letting them know what they can do, what are the options out there, as much as you know. We don't want to pressure them to take action. I've heard lots of friends say, oh, well, my friend told me not to come back to them until I broke up with my abusive partner. Placing conditions on support like that is not about creating that comfort, that rapport. We really want to make sure that we're letting that person make those choices themselves. You know, do you want to file a report? We don't want to tell them that it was their fault. We do want to say it was not your fault, no matter what the circumstances are. The accountability for the violence is falls with the person who committed that act. We would always want to hold the person who's being violent accountable for their actions. So just a few more tools about being a good ally. We want to ensure safety and privacy. When engaging in a conversation, we want to make sure that there's, you know, are you in a public arena? Sometimes people might feel very comfortable sharing in the hallway, but it might not be the safest or the most private conversation. You might have to say, can we talk about this later? You know, can we want to give me a call when, we've, when it's just the two of us? Or let's meet up for coffee um, and then we'll go to a, a private location. Because talking about this stuff can, can be very emotional. We want to give people the space and the, um, the room to react appropriately and to, to react as they are going to react. We do want to also consider their emotions as part of this safety. Um, somebody that is trying to leave an abusive partner, it might take them several times to break that off. They might go back and we want to be patient. Um, and one of the ways that they can really make those choices stick is to help them build up their emotions, help them feel good about themselves, help them feel strong. We want to listen fully, effectively, actively, empathetically. A lot of survivors have told us, oh, I tried to tell somebody, but they just didn't listen. And we want you all, as possible supporters and allies, to be really able to listen fully. We always want to maintain someone's confidence. Um, we don't want to be sharing anybody else's story unless they give express permission. Some survivors are really very open and invite their story to be told, but we never want to tell someone else's story without their permission. A handful of exceptions in that regard. If somebody does say that they are unsafe or they are feeling threatened, we always want to call public safety. We want to ensure safety all around, and that's something that our office would do as well. If we think that a survivor is unsafe, that they are being immediately, they're immediately in danger, we are going to call public safety as well. We want to always recognize our limitations. Know what your role is, how can you help, and then exert those boundaries. That can be really important for a survivor to know, you know what, this person is a great person to help me, you know, go through my physical day, you know, my everyday actions, help me make sure I get some laundry done, or maybe eat a nice hot meal. But the other person, you know, somebody at SVR is the person who can go with me to my court appointments. Those kinds of things are really important for, for survivors to hear about other people's abilities to help. We want to provide non-judgmental and supportive information. And then lastly, refer them to appropriate resources. It might be to Sexual Violence Response, our office. It might be to a community-based organization. It might be to file a report with the university. But we always want to encourage them to, to get that help that they need. So just to recap a little bit about what our services are, we do provide direct services that are free and confidential. Those include crisis counseling intervention, information, advocacy, emotional support, 
safety planning. So if somebody is especially involved in an intimate partner violent relationship or is being stalked, we want to make sure that they feel safe. And there's specific steps that we're going to help a survivor walk through in order to ensure their safety. And maybe somebody isn't about to leave an abusive relationship just yet, but they're planning on it. Maybe making sure that they're going to stay safe in the meantime. And then after that breakup takes place, it's really important to keep in, in place some of those safety measures. You know, somebody who's just left an abusive partner, that abusive partner might get upset later on down the line, and we need to make sure that that person stays safe. And then lastly, accompaniment. And to access, access those services, there's a couple ways to do it. The one way that we always know will work is the um, helpline 212-854-HELP. It's available 24-7, 365, so even on breaks, even at 2 a.m., no matter what time, what day of the year, our helpline is always available on holidays, no matter what. Um, we also have walk-in uh, hours that are available. You can see those hours on our website. Um, and so those are oftentimes during business hours, you know, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so just in case somebody does need those services outside of those hours, then we're always going to work with a survivor and with their schedule to get them the help that they need. But that helpline is a great way to get started. We do have a peer advocate program. Um, so one of the ways that you can get involved with our office is through peer advocacy. If you're interested in gaining some skills, going through a certification training that is a, a New York State Department of Health certified training. We also do education and training, so informative presentations, kind of like this one where we might be more presenting information to an audience, um, something like the dynamics of intimate partner violence. I know I've touched briefly on that a little bit today, but there's a whole lot more that we could talk about. Just one example. We also do interactive workshops. These are my personal favorite because that means that I get to hear what the audience is having to say and really direct the conversation based on what are the interests and in, um, uh, what the students are saying or what participants are saying during those workshops. One example is a workshop that's called Relationships, Dates, and Hookups, talking about both healthy and unhealthy behaviors in a variety of contexts. And then we also have skills-based training sessions. So that's, those are going to be a little bit more in-depth, going to help participants really gain those skills. They'll be longer, probably two, three, four, five hours. Um, something like we have a facilitation skills workshop that we did this past spring, and then another one we do is by center intervention. Thinking about how can participants gain those skills and practice intervening in a variety of situations. And then we always have our information posted on our website, which is health.columbia.edu backslash SVR. And you can always learn more about our workshops and then request a workshop online. So there's a, a workshop request form there. And then just to note that they can be tailored for specific groups. So if you uh, see our catalog of workshops and you're not quite seeing exactly what you want to cover, we can always work with a group. Um, for example, if somebody is interested in a particular population or maybe intimate partner violence within um, a community or something like that, we can work with somebody to develop that program. And then lastly, we do have a peer education program um, where there is training and then students will go out and facilitate programs with the student body. So lastly, we do outreach. We have our print materials, awareness events. There's a quite a bit that happens during October, which nationally is known as Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but here on campus we refer to it as Relationship Violence Awareness Month. And so you'll see a lot more events, maybe some materials available, posters on campus. And then in April, it's Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so a similar period of time. We do have things that are happening year-round, but just those two months we do kind of the most amount of things. And then lastly, our Facebook page is a great way to think more about this issue. We post a lot of thought-provoking articles, encourage people to really think beyond just Consent 101 or about our services. Really want to encourage people to think about it because this is such a complicated and nuanced issue. And then lastly, we do have our website um, in terms of learning more about our office and what we do and the issue at large. So, um, we do have three locations um, here at Columbia University. In the Morningside campus, we're in Lerner Hall, which is the same building as the Columbia University Bookstore. We're on the seventh floor there. And then we also are, have two satellite locations, one being on the Barnard campus, which is across the way, in Hewitt Hall, room 105. And then on the medical campus, that office just opened in 
March, so it's one of our newest satellite locations, and that's in Bard Hall, room 206. And then we are always available on our helpline, 212-854-HELP. I encourage folks to go ahead and put that in their phones because you never know when you're going to need it. And having that information at the ready is one of the ways that we can really help support somebody that's experienced trauma or violence. And then lastly, we do have our Facebook and our, help, on our website. So just to note that we know we have three locations because some survivors are gonna feel more comfortable going to one location over the other. It could be that, you know, yes, Lerner is just down the way, but they would rather go to the one at the medical campus. And so we wanna make sure that any survivor, all survivors are available, are, are able to get the services that they need in places that they can get them. So just a few closing thoughts before we go. Just to emphasize that no one deserves to experience violence and that everyone does deserve to have healthy, positive, consensual experiences and that if something does happen, we are here to help. So thank you all very much.